the good thing about that is that we've trained nurses. Now, this is not related to what I'm talking about here, right? But I'll just give you a brief uh, background. We trained nurses. Uh, we're looking at the burden of disease uh, in this present day and age. I mean, looking back in the last 30 years, we never had, uh, in fact, anybody who was born um, in the last 30 years doesn't know the world without HIV. That's correct. So all those that were born before that, uh, who were 40 probably more, uh, obviously you existed once uh, when there was no HIV in the world, not to know, right? Now, as, as the years progress, you'd find that uh, there were these diseases that were uh, new to many uh, government departments, departments of health, and the burden of disease was actually escalating. And it couldn't be easy for any government department to deal with these new found diseases, all right? People are dying and there are thousands and millions and so on, and nobody knows how to deal with this thing. So, but basically, uh, the other thing is that you then have the old nursing staff that is phasing out of the Department of Health Services, uh, retiring, and then you have the new ones that are just uh, new nurses and so on. The both things that are common with the two is that the ones that are nurses that are phasing out would be, you know, uh, the, the retiring, obviously, all right? And, and, and obviously, they, they, they are not, uh, prone to understand what HIV and the other complications with these diseases and so on. Mm -hmm. And then the new guys that are the new nurses, they are more or less, but you know, they don't have the commitment and the passion as the older generation. Mm -hmm. So we had to bridge the gap, train them, and make sure that you know there's some understanding of which is how to get, have some efficacies around dealing with the better of disease around HIV and so on. This, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, okay. So, yeah. So we did a lot of training on nurses, uh, and then our, the, the statistics that we got there were reported to the standing the portfolio committee for health in the province, and then the South African National um, uh, Department of Health, uh, but also the the the, the uh, World Health Organization. Okay, now when I used to teach or, or to to facilitate with people, I used to say, if you don't know where you're going. You will get there. Pardon? If you don't know where you're going, uh -huh. you will get there. You don't know. Okay. Yeah, and they're being anyway for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> so they're being anyway. So wherever it's like a song that I remember now, it says, Wherever I lay my head, that's my home. That's pretty strange and odd, isn't it? I mean, wherever you lay your head, that's your home. That's, that's strange, that's ridiculous. You must have one home, right? So, uh, and I guess what I'm trying to say here is this, why I would say wherever, I mean, if you don't know where you're going, you will get there. Mm -hmm. Basically, it deals with the issue of not having a strategy. Okay. Right? Not having a strategy. And, and not, not being able to understand and know where you have actually reached. How you have, what are the indicators that will tell you that I am there? Mm -hmm. Or even not there as yet, but at least I'm getting there. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, it obviously, um, gives you. Let me tell you just one simple thing when I was growing up. I used to. I didn't like mathematics. I didn't. Like, I really didn't like mathematics. Um, and the strangest thing that used to happen was uh, when, when, when the math teacher would. Okay, you would write. You know, us as kids, we would copy from the other. Yeah. You'll do that, eh? I'm sure you guys never did that. Yeah. yeah. So, so as kids, you really would say, this thing might be difficult, eh? And then, and then you would just, you would just copy that. And the teacher is clever. They know that you are not that much capable of certain, yeah. understanding certain things. And you will call you, eh, we will say, come here. And you know when you've done wrong, they will give you that voice, come here. You go there, you know. And they will say, how did you reach this answer? Mm. Yeah. The answer is right, eh? Mm. The answer is okay, you, you copied everything. The answer is, but it's the formula <laughs> that he wants to know. How did you get this? You see, so it becomes important to have a strategy, which obviously opens into a formula. And this is basically I'm trying to tell you about how I reached the point where I am now. Okay. Right? Not there yet. Mm. Yeah? Not as this point is well. But, but, but not there yet, no? <laughs> not there yet, but you, you are getting there, all right? So it, it actually allows you to ask yourself in the mid-course, mid the 
questions like how, yeah? when, who, and why. Those basically become the most important questions for you to understand when you have an objective or something to achieve. All right? Uh, it somewhat makes you think that you are, you are wired differently. Yeah? You get a new sense of uh, values, discipline, that really formulates a strategy for you to reach the part and the point where you want to reach. All right? The second thing that I wanted to tell you about is um, I'm a keen Bible reader. All right? And one of the things that I came, I came across in the Bible was an interesting story that I talked about. Um, I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to it's an interesting story though, but, but it talked about it talked about a journey of a nation which was for four hundred years under under slavery. And these guys are called Israelites and they were slaves uh, for four hundred years uh, in Egypt. Now the story goes on that they were told somehow that they would be liberated. There comes a certain Young Mandela from his country mm -hmm. liberates them. And they all they all got excited, you know, and shook it. Ah, I'm going to leave this place. I'm not going to be slaves forever. It was a good thing maybe for them. But eventually uh, they, they, they really did uh, that day came. They were sent out in the open mm -hmm. desert. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But I want you to note one thing on the story. There's two things that are important. They were told that the day will come for them to be. That's it. But the second thing is that they were told where they were going. And how they have known when they reached that place that they were told that they were going to? They were told they were going to a land of what? Of milk and honey. I've never been to what? And I hope to go there someday. Yeah? They were told they were going to a land of, so it tells you one thing. Where, how are we going to know when we are there? Milk and honey. Those are the indicators. Those are telltale signs. When we're there, we'll see milk plus honey. <laughs> Probably make chocolate or something else, right? So it tells you then that you can't, you can't, you can't do anything, go anywhere without formulating a strategy. And the strategy starts from within. That's why I said when I started, when I started if you don't know where you're going, you will get there. Your intention is to go somewhere, right? But the destination is not clearly defined in terms of where is that somewhere? How, we, how am I going to know when I've arrived there? And obviously there are questions that you ask yourself mid-course. Questions like, am I there yet? Have you two ever uh, watched uh, the kids? Eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, what's that movie? It's a movie, it's called Are yeah, but there, there's another there's another one, it's cartoons that I watch with my kids, with the green monster, the guy. Shrek. Shrek, yes. Yeah. Shrek two or three. Donkey. Donkey, yeah. Uh, it's a constant pain. Yeah. 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 Right? So those become the necessary questions that really mark the indicator to say. Are you there yet? Yeah? And it actually keeps you awake to say, how do I know that I'm there? Or so that how would I know if I'm at least close to being there? Okay? Do I see the light at the end of the tunnel? All right? So yes, um, this computer here. Where are you, Mia? Where are you? Uh, uh, okay, all right. Uh, oops. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, I think next. Oh, thank you. Okay, now, because you guys are such good students, uh, Ombo, in fact, do, dealing with the, what I'm told that I'm talking about here is the role of entrepreneurs in, uh, in small, which medium size. Of, what's the topic again? <coughs> the role of entrepreneurs. The contribution role of uh, small to medium sized enterprises. But I've come across such interesting notes here that there is a distinction between theoretical and operational definitions of entrepreneurship. I think that we know. And in general, the theoretical definitions are wide, covering a number of um, entrepreneurial activities, uh, whereas the operationalized definitions cover a singular aspect. 
and that's by Ogbo. Now Chanda says, uh, he defines entrepreneurship as, a, as dealing with uncertainty. Okay? Making a distinction between a risk, which can be calculated, and uncertainty, which cannot. Now there are things that when you start a business, for instance, I'll tell you a bit of this much. When I decided to take the final jump from formal employment, I was working, you know, very happy, very well with, with the non-governmental sector. It, it pays much. It's not like you're working for government there. You know, the salary is good, and the, all the other things, you get to travel a lot, you know, and all the other things, you know, that comes with it. But it also, you know, uh, demands you. Okay? One of the things that I learned there is that you need to be self-driven, self-motivated. But what actually caused me to take the final leap to jump off and, and start uh, you know, trenching myself into business was this lesson. Uh, in the advent of 2010, one of the other things that you observed in the world was the global economic crisis. You remember that? Yes. Yeah? So working in the, in the non-governmental organizations, or I mean donor-funded organizations, obviously that is a direct impact on donor-funded organizations. Right? Because it means if you are, our project was countrywide, obviously in other African states as well. Uh, like we have been in, uh, in Uganda, um, Kampala, and all the other outskirts of Uganda. But the main thing around that was that we had to close down on most of our projects. And the Eastern Cape was the first one. I was given an opportunity to say, look, uh, you can either go to KZN or maybe go to Limbombo, uh, and I said, hey, I don't know Sutu mm. or Tswana. No Zulu. And I don't like being with Zulu. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> All right? So, so I had to wait, but the, the, the basic thing was that, look, I, I have a young family that I want to provide for, and I want to be close by, and I want to see my kids grow. And I want to be here one month, the other month I'm away, or maybe I want to be here. Uh, here with only on the weekends, the whole time I'm away in wherever which other province and so on. So then I had to think quickly on my feet and say, look, let me make an exit strategy. And I told myself earlier on in my life that I will never turn 40 and still be working for somebody else. Okay. Okay. And I, uh, when I looked into my bank account, I didn't have much though, mm -hmm. but I still had that belief, that conviction that I will never reach 40 still working, come there ain't no high waters. No one do that. Okay? So I then started, okay, let me start opening up a company. Then now you can do, you can have a company, do catering and so on, whilst you're still employed in a, in, in, because I'm not in company. Mm -hmm. All right? So we started out with that, and uh, somebody told me that, look, Phil, why don't you start security? There's money in security. I said, ah, man, you know, I hate cards, the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do in security? These guys, are, they just very take me to bits. So I <laughs> think or imagine working with them day in and day out. But then I thought, oh, I'm a qualified trainer, an assessor, and moderator with the other related CITAS. So what I did when I started my company, I went to SACITA, registered for as a training, an accredited training provider. That was one thing. Then I thought, yeah, man, you know what? Maybe there's something in this security thing. Yeah? without dealing with the guards, but you know, dealing with another component. Mm -hmm. And then I did the, uh, uh, the process of accrediting my business and got to be accredited on MPF level three mm -hmm. and level four. Now your level three is your basic metric equivalent, right? And that the, the cost there, the qualification is general security practices. Now, the interesting bit about it is this, GSP, at the end of it, it will land you with an equivalent to an electric certificate, and that's a qualification. Now, if you look at the scale of all the security personnel in this country, maybe 75% of them had they reached standard eight. Mm -hmm. All right? So, okay, that's an inch there. All right? Number two, uh, then the end of level four, that's your FET certificate. Yeah? That's a post metric qualification. Mm -hmm. So I thought, all right. 
Maybe this is where much about I am talking, giving people skills and they get money in the process and they also get uh, highly marketable afterwards. Okay? So this is a good uh, deal that I see here. But then again, I thought, what else do I want to do with security? I thought, okay, around here we have AKT, Red Alert, we have Patrick and Henderson, we have Robot, we have, you know, um, many others, Code Blue, um, we have all of these other, and, and, and these businesses are white owned. Yeah? Not trying to not trying to be sort of racially, you know, yeah. but 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 in a way trying to look at an opportunity there. Mm-hmm. Where the why is it that there are no black guys that are doing I mean there's so many black guys that are into security, but why is it that they're not there within those things? And, and it allowed me to probe more into the industry. What does it take for one to get into that specific specialized uh, security uh, division? Mm-hmm. Alright? Uh, which means Installations of of, uh, of, of um, alarm systems, but also providing armed response. And I thought I want to do that. All right. Yeah. But into the internet, I searched, checked. Are we dealing with this part where right, um, taking risks, right? Yeah. And and it's quite one. It's true, correct that you need to calculate most of the risks that you're taking in business. And you can never be a successful business person if you're not willing to take any risks yeah. regarding to grow your business. So risk taking becomes an integral part of the growth of your business and your strategy. Because again, with taking that risk also comes the point, the part where you must put the strategy in terms of how the risks that you take do not run your business down. Okay? Remember, you have at least existed from somewhere and you've gone some distance. And where you are, you at least at a point where you see you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Mm -hmm. But then you also see that if I do this, I'm more or less going to run my business back three steps backwards. Mm -hmm. And it would take me forever to go back to where it was, okay? So this is why it says that whatever risks that you take, you must have a level of really making sure that you balance them. You don't go way too much. That's what they call, uh, sometimes uh, the investor language, they call that um, reckless investment. Yeah. You can't you can't say if you want to invest in a business and just okay, I'm gonna plow two million on this business. Without having to do a due diligence. How what sustains this business? What makes this business what it is? What makes it tick, where are its strong points, its weaknesses, and where does it want to be strengthened? And are you guaranteed the return of your investment? Okay? So those become the questions that you ask yourself and the strategies that really would hold and inform that if you are investing on this business, it's surely going to at least succeed. So much that at least it has some return of your investment. All right, so um, this uh, Ushenda defines entrepreneurship as dealing with uncertainty. I think that we've covered, yeah? Yeah. As dealing with uncertainty, making a distinction between risk which can be calculated, and uncertainty. Which, now that's, this, that's another aspect where you live simply by faith. Just you put your, your, your faith ahead of you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm, it's going to stop me from, look, you can go and make presentations to, to other people and say, look, I'm trying to do this, this, and that, and that. So, there are people out there that are, that are ready to steal other people's ideas. Yeah. Really and what's going to stop you Oh, what's going to stop if you have a brilliant idea, somebody else not stealing it, but running away with it because they've got money mm-hmm. than you are, then, mm-hmm. and they would run with your business play, I mean, business concept. And before you know it, somebody else is doing it. And you say, oh, my mother, that's my, <laughs> that's my dream. How? <laughs> they snatched my dream from right in front of my nose. And that's a, that's a reality. So this is where you, you say, if you really do make those presentations go to people and discuss, because at the end of the day, your business will not go anywhere if you don't network, interact with people. So that's why I'm saying at times it is sheer faith and the sheer belief on something that, okay, this is going to, but also the difference between just normal business people and entrepreneurs is that entrepreneurs are driven by passion. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. 
that I mean, and the, the, the aspect about passion is this, even if you fail today, it's not stopping you to wake up tomorrow and try something else new. Or much less, still go with the same idea, but in a different way. All right? You change approaches as mid-course of whatever that you're doing as you go along, right? Uh, yeah. Was come Peter? Is it sure Peter? Was come Peter? Yeah. Let me personalize it. It's come Peter. He describes the entrepreneur as the as the bearer. Uh, of the mechanism for change and economic development. And that's one of the aspects that we're going to be delivering. The importance of uh, small to medium sized um, uh, entrepreneur or enterprises in any country. Now these guys are, these guys are well obviously risk takers and so on, but, but they are really what makes the economy go around for the growth of the economy. In fact, I think one of the other things that we would understand is that Second to government in South Africa, the largest employer is the SME sector. Second to government, the plastic and so on. The second largest, biggest employer are SMEs. Um, and good government and continuation as the undertaking of new ideas and new combinations, that is innovation. So that's another thing. Um, obviously, people that are like entrepreneurs, you might have your ideas latched now, it's stopping you to dream again. Okay? But at least the nice dream that you have, you are careful not to blab it out to anyone who needs to come across it. Hey, you know what I dreamt that I would make ice from, or I could make ice cream from potato pills. No. And I'll start asking, but what have you been smoking? Right? So, so you, you, you really, as an entrepreneur, that, that's one of the other good things about it, is that these guys are not, are not uh, shy to expose their creative assets. And it's, it's, it's a wonder that you see one of the biggest uh, sellers today is uh, recycling. People can recycle almost, almost anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just turned it down to an idea from one person. To say, if I use this bottle, what else can I use it for? Right? So you bring it down in, in, to, to its lowest component. You break it down into a million pieces it is, to its lowest component and redefine it or redesign it to, so to be something else new. It's many cells. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Again, on the second slide, we're defini uh, defining entrepreneurship. Opara, since the entrepreneur as an individual who has the zeal and ability to find and evaluate opportunities. He further observes that they are calculated risk takers who enjoy the excitement of challenges, not necessarily gamblers. Yeah? But the role of entrepreneurship has been different across countries. Obviously, it can be the same. If you go to uh, London, England, People that are there are not the same as us in terms of the same caliber of being entrepreneurs. Obviously, this has more to do with the access to you know, resources, availability to funding, to kickstart some businesses, and so on. But you find that most places, in my case, um, uh, when, when, when in 2011, I really, in September 2011, I then made that final decision that, okay, I'm not going back to work. I'm resigning and I took my packages and whatever else that is there. And somewhere in the mid course of 2012, I tried to invest most of my money in kids selling this business. And, uh, you know, as, as it would be like in anyone, um, things were not that smooth. I had to make some classic decisions. I, had, I owned then a C class compressor, a C200 Mercedes. I had to watch it being taken by the bank. I only owed, at the time, I owed about 60,000 rands on the car. Just about 60,000 bucks with a further, what, 18, no, no, maybe less than that, almost a year, 12 months, I would have finished at the installment rate that I was paying then, right? But I didn't, I thought, I, I still have another car. I still have, a, I had a Ford Phantom bike here, I had another 
here. So I still have, I still have two other cars, so it's fine. It would be, it was, it was actually an accident. I would just drive in the townships and look at the project. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on my Mac, so, so uh, you, 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 really, you really apply yourself and your essence into your business. And yeah, I, I told you I talked too much. <laughs> now I'm told that I have to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what I'm trying to say here is this: most of what you 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 do, in my case, I had to use my own resources. And guess one one of the terrible things that happened was that I couldn't even go to the bank after having a car repossessed. Buy a bank. What does it do to your credit worthiness? Kills it. So I couldn't go anywhere to say, look. But if they could, you know, I would apply and so on, and they would reach that part and say, okay, you know, this is the business you apply for, business loan and so on. Okay, let's give you your ID number and so on. Hey, like Mr. Nsa, you know that. There's always that red flag. So you start thinking, this is not gonna stop me from reaching my, you know, destiny, so to speak. So you keep fighting, you keep fighting, you keep fighting, and from not stopping, this is basically defining some of the statistics about around, I mean, uh, but I'm gonna leave this uh, here. Um, I pretty much have talked about my journey. Uh, uh, I thought I had asked uh, oh. to put in the... Okay, I'll, the I'll refer them to the website. Um, um. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, this is uh, my company. That's one of the vehicles that the company has. Uh, we're into security technologies. And one of the things that I'm very good with uh, any other business is strategic partnerships. And I'm going to raise this um, in, 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 in brief. One of the other partners that I just come across is a company called STSS Fidelity. And they're based in Joburg. They're a company that is um, from Israel. Now, the Israeli are very good in terms of surveillance. They are the world leaders in surveillance technology. So I'm, I'm partnering with them in terms of the, uh, the installation plans of CCTV cameras, uh, biometric machines, and also doing offsite monitoring and also doing, uh, these are smoke alarm systems. And, and these would be your intruder alarm systems, uh, these ones. And they're providing other response as well. And there you see a card. <laughs> <laughs> now they've become one of my friends. There's, there's my friends. Now we also do a bit about facilities management. There are opportunities around uh, everywhere we go. Uh, obviously, sometimes in, even in issues of uh, property development, <coughs> where you find any property that is being um, developed, you can go make presentations to say, look, I can mm -hmm. offer this service. Mm -hmm. If there's a mall that is going to be erected, mm -hmm. we can also go there. We can do a lot of things. There's flats that we also do facilities management uh, in here around Southern Road and elsewhere, um, around this London area, where you would um, really even to a point where you even, you even sort out the issues of payments of the monthly rents and give it to the owner. Uh, obviously with the fee that comes back to you. So there's, a lot of, there's lots and lots of opportunities um, that are there. Uh, yes, one of the other things I wanted and I didn't mention was my partnership with Institute um, um, of Higher Learning. And in this case, I have a partnership with Buffalo City College. And I'm trying to extend to all other colleges like your Ikala College in uh, Queenstown, and um, there's another college in Badawath, uh, King Insa College, and uh, in Nwe, in, out, out in the, in the, in the, in the, the Trans Guy. I think it's uh, Mount, I don't know, it's Flagstaff, and that area is so over there. Um, now, one of the things here is because I have this trade, these parts about uh, the technologies, uh, CCTV cameras, and so on. Now the issue is this, they've got an electrical engineering uh, component. Now what I'm about is training, giving skills, and capacitating poor guards to become highly marketable. All right? Now we train them how to assemble, break apart and assemble and, uh, and install and fix those CCTV cameras. Okay? And they get a qualification as security technicians. They're still in the security industry, but now as, as technicians. All right. So not only the qualifications are credited by the company. Remember, I said I'm a training provider as well. So you do recognition of prior learning, and 
and also including the certification of a uh, of a of a letter, all right? But not only that, but we have a joint certification process with a, a reputable institution <coughs> in the name of Buffalo City College. Okay, so that also becomes part of uh, the, the 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 models in terms of growing your business, which is the partnerships, and then obviously funding is always a, a serious a scarce thing to get. But one needs to learn to survive without that much of funding. Because if, 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 if there is no funding, does it mean there will be no entrepreneurs, there will be no people that will think of ideas of revolutionary change in the world and the economy of the world, or even of South Africa and so on? All right? So you don't have to wait for funding from somewhere. Uh, uh, one of the other things are that we have partnership up all around with, with SSF and SS, STSS Fidelity is they have got a project in Ekurulein municipality where the freeway from the toll road, uh, they, they've got satellite, satellite uh, technology <coughs> which, which they are using um, as, as off-site monitoring. So it says there are no cameras here but they're looking at it from, from a satellite. And it does the monitoring of the freeway accidents, anything that are happening. I think there was something that came out in the media some time ago around a robbery that happened in a highway mm -hmm. where a police officer got shot in the face. Mm -hmm. And those guys were apprehended thanks to that surveillance um, technology. Wow. All right? So those are the guys that we are uh, lessons learned not to trust anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, uh, you learn to, well, to trust yourself, number one. But also, you take advice from people. But as in everything, you take your journey one day at a time. And that's what marks the success of anybody. So if you live it a day at a time, and try and learn. Because one, one of the other things about um, any journey is the inevitability of making mistakes and how you Reinvent yourself, and I'm using that carefully. Reinvent yourself after every uh, possible mistake that you would have made in your in journey towards your success. But the one thing, like I said before, if you don't know where you're going, you will get there. So the issue is then about you reinventing yourself, redefining yourself, yeah? and and perhaps reprogramming yourself in terms of when you're meeting. Because you can never, when challenges come, they will always come in different ways, and you need to identify when trouble comes. In a, you need to have a, a trained nose to smell it a mile away. When, 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 when Dr. Chinimuridi comes, and I will know, hmm, I smell trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right? But yes, it means that you must be techy, you must train, you must train yourself. And besides, one of the other things I never mentioned to you guys is that I'm also a radio personality. I'm with in Tanzania FM, but that's another thing. So, so I get to speak for three hours. So if you don't stop me, I won't play in Advent or anything. I'll just talk. All right, guys, I think that's basically, um, in a nutshell, the essence of why um, uh, people exist as entrepreneurs, and why it's important to have those. That's a different cadership, that's a different caliber of people. Those guys that you call entrepreneurs. They are serious about stuff, eh? Yeah. Yeah. They are serious about stuff. They don't take things lightly, yeah. all right? They don't take things lightly. And, and, and when they are there, you know that they are there, because you look at, now I've come here driving a Polo, a Vita Polo, and then when I'm there, you yeah. won't ask, and you know when I when I see you uh, on the road, I say hi, hi. But when I'm driving my, uh, I'm just. <laughs> That's an indicator that I'm there. Um, what we'll do, we'll take questions later on uh, as, a, as a panel.